Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. In this episode, we go and do the Age of Revolution from 1750 to 1850. We're going to do three revolutions, the American, the French, and the Haitian. And the question that's going to be applied is, who controls the state? Who controls the economy? The traditional elites or the new rising elites? Notice we're not saying the middle class. Notice we're not saying poor people. It's the traditional elites who have had power for hundreds of years or these new rising elites based on new economy, new economics, new money. The great question of the Age of Revolution is, does the ideas of the Enlightenment have power? Can you put Locke, Hobbes, Rousseau, Montesquieu, Descartes into action? Or are they just philosophy? Is it pie in the sky, platonic ideals of Thomas More's utopia? Or is it the nitty gritty of reality? So the American Revolution starts with who controls the state. And that question resolve, revolves around representation, not taxation. This is one of those lies of American society that the, the Americans revolted because of taxes. They didn't. It's not the taxes. In fact, if you wanted to pay less taxes, the, Americans, the American colonists would never have revolted because by the time you got into the revolution and after the revolution, ta they were paying way more taxes than they had as British citizens. If it was about taxation, the best thing they could have done is stayed British. And not fought a war. A war quintuples. Was it deciples? It goes up by 10 times taxes. I mean, there's way, way. You, you would never have fought the revolution if you didn't want to pay taxes. So it's not about taxation. It's about representation. Do we have a say in the laws. Who makes the laws? The king 3,500 miles away or the elites here, the people here? Now, not the poor people. The poor people never matter in the making of the laws. They're subject to the laws. They don't make them. So is it the king who applies, who can make the law for all of the subjects or is it the local elites, the new elites, who can make the laws for the local situation? So, does the king make the laws for Virginia? Or do the local rich people in Virginia make the laws for Virginia? That's the question. That's ultimately the question of the American Revolution. There's a secondary question. Who determines the slave status? Is it the king and British society? Or is it American society, the American colonial society? Because in British society, abolition was happening. It will finally happen in the 1830s, but it was already on the move. There was already rules against owning slaves in Britain. There were rules against having white people as slaves. There was rules against having British people as slaves. There was, there was already the movement towards abolition of slavery. In fact, during the American Revolution, the British will free slaves who agree to fight against the American colonists, against the American Revolution, and then ship 10,000 African slaves, freedmen, because they're not slaves anymore, they were British soldiers, they were freedmen, to Canada, where they will form a core group of the African-American, african Canadian community of Toronto and Montreal. So who determines if we get slaves, if Americans are going to be a slave society or not? American slave owners or the king across the ocean? And why is this even a question? Well, because slavery is the great question of the alignment. We didn't really touch upon it when I did the alignment pieces because, well, 
because everybody thinks it's bad. Slavery is versus Locke and Rousseau and the Bible. It doesn't work. Hobbes doesn't like slavery, but it's like the weak versus the, the it's the strong versus the weak. So it's you suffer. So it's it would be better for Hobbes, it's better than the chaos of a of a revolution. Of which the American Revolution kind of proves him right, but not, I don't know, because 2% of Americans will die during the American Revolution. The American Revolution is one of the bloodiest wars America ever fights. It's kind of forgotten, but cities are burned. The farmlands destroyed. Like It's kind of forgotten just how destructive the American Revolution really was. And slavery is against the idea of free people. Rousseau is all people are born free but live in chains. That's literally slavery. Locke, Samuel Johnson, the, the, the writers of this period look at slavery, even when they benefit from it, as non-humanistic. As a problem. So. What you get to this question of representation. Is that as the king. Of England and the parliament of England. Begin to tell the colonies what to do. After the French. And. Uh, the war of. Uh, seven years war of 1756. Um. The French and Indian War, as it's known in America, you start to get colonial resistance. No, 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 no. We like the things the way they are. We want to determine how things go. The The truth of the matter is, when it comes to taxation, the American colonists were free freeloaders. They weren't paying their fair share. The British were protecting them. The British had a navy. The British had an army. The British fought the French. The British won with some colonial help, but they were also fighting in India, in the Caribbean. The Americans were still British. They won. But because everyone was occupied with the wars, a lot of those taxes, a lot of those sales taxes, rules about who you could trade with, were, were kind of let go. So now that you had peace they start enforcing the rules again and the the colonists didn't like that and so you get a colonial resistance that equal to force response right so you get people being arrested you get some spies you get some some troublemakers or well, we're going to have to punish them well that creates violent resistance the boston tea party protests marches that then escalate to a violent response and thus British aggression created more support for independence the Brit the, the Boston Massacre is what five people are killed in it so it's like hardly a massacre you know five people being murdered at one time is what happens every day in America and we it never makes the news there's a ma mass shooting that's four or more people dead Every day. No one cares. So it's it's great. At the time, it was calling it the Boston Massacre was great PR. But it, it made the idea that the British government wasn't listening. The colonial government and the king king's government, parliament, wasn't listening. So there's this escalation and escalation, escalation. So British aggression created more support for independence because if the king could attack Boston, people started to say, what about us? And then when the British laid siege to Boston, basically, after Concord and Lexington, which is the start of the American, but it really isn't. Like, then there's a peace, but the, the British Navy puts Boston on the blockade they put Boston City under siege, basically, occupy the town, and 
there's like, um, if they could do it to Boston, what about us? What about New York? What about Baltimore? What about Charleston? What about us? So it's this feeling that the British army, the British government, wasn't playing by their own rules. And they're, they're going too far. And so ultimately you get the Declaration of Independence. The British push the American colonists as the American elite so far that in Philadelphia, where we, we all are, these American elites decide we are going to break up with Britain. And that is the Declaration of Independence. It is a rich person's breakup letter. That's all it is. For all its flowery language, it is a, um, it's not us, it's you letter of we don't want to hang out with you anymore. 41 of the 56 signers owned slaves. They were all rich people. All of them were rich. There was no middle class. There was no poor person there. They were all rich people. And 41 of them owned slaves. And so you can see the attitude that they have. There are new elites who don't want to be told what to do by the traditional elites across the sea. They're like, we're in America now. I get to make the rules. I don't want to be told what to do by you, Mr. King, from far away. And Jefferson is sampling Locke. He's just flat out just sampling it. He's got the beats going down. It's like everyone who reads the Declaration of Independence is like, dude, this is Locke all over the place. Like, you got a fat Locke beat. Boom, boom, boom. Because it's all Locke. There's no Hobbes. There's no Rousseau in it. I mean, liberty, life, liberty, is a direct quote from Locke. So everyone knows it's a Lockean thing. Now remember what Locke says. Locke says all people are awesome and they can make their own rules. They can agree to their own lives. Notice Jefferson's leaving out like about 400,000 Africans. African slaves toiling away. They have no freedom. They have no ability to determine their government. They have no ability to determine the rules they live under. Just left that out. So when he says all men are created equal, Jefferson is quoting Locke, but everybody knows that it, all men ain't men, ain't all men. That all is fictional. It is a platonic ideal word because the man part is the definition. Who is a man? Not the Africans, not the Catholics, by the way, not the Irish, the Germans, eh, maybe we'll see. So, and women, and the man part is specific, uh, women definitely don't. White, black, brown, n- nope. So, the Declaration of Independence is a breakup letter by rich people to rich people. So, we're going to have a war. And victory in that war happens because it's simply too expensive to keep fighting in the colonies. The British could have kept coming. After Yorktown, it's like, oh, it's over after Yorktown. The British could have, if they had wanted to, if it was worthwhile, sent another army. They still occupied New York. They, the Yorktown didn't kick the British out of America. They're still occupied New York, the, the richest city, the most important port. I mean, there's Philadelphia, yeah, but New York is already becoming New York in a way but it wasn't worth it the British government the king is fighting in India and the Caribbean so they gave up the the woods of North America the nothing that is the woods of North America for India and to control the Caribbean the West Indies and that was way worth way more money I mean look I love America I'm an American but let's that's four million of us wasn't worth Jamaica, much less Haiti, much less Barbados, much less India in terms of when you looked at the when you looked at the money. A bunch of crazy ass Yahoo farmers in the woods of North America, please. 
compared to the sugar plantations of the Caribbean or the silk and spice and opium fields of India? Come on, you'd make that deal too. So they traded North America for India and it was a way better deal. It was worth way more. Now it turns out America becomes a great country, but you would never have known that in 1780, 1785. In fact, in 1785, it looked like our country was coming apart and about to murder each other in large numbers. So what is the result? What is the result of the American Revolution? In Europe, not much. Literally, I, I mean, you know, people are like, oh, the American Revolution start. No, it really didn't. Because it's a bunch of crazy people in the woods. It didn't affect European politics or philosophy. You do not have large numbers of of German peasants being like, oh, I wish we could be American now. And they don't care. Their lives aren't affected by America. It's 4,000 miles away. It's three months by for news. It's a bunch of crazy people talking about how they're free and you want to be able to murder natives and enslave Africans. Like, you could be a French peasant. You've never met an African anything. An African slave. You don't even know what that is. So, for Europe, not much. And in fact, remember that it doesn't change much in America. We'll get to that. But they stay... the. There's all this, oh, America is now allied with France. No, 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 no. The British colonies broke up with England and then kept trading with England as if nothing had ever happened. They kept trading as if nothing had happened. They continued to be, you know, the mediocre trade partners that they were behind the Caribbean sugar, sugar islands, behind India, behind China. Good for wood. You know, a good place for Europe to, to, to sell its goods, but it's just not much. It was just, the American Revolution is important because America becomes important. But that's like saying the, 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 the Peruvian independence was important. It, it just didn't affect Europe that much. For Native Americans, this is a disaster. Without British protection, they're going to be exterminated. Their land is going to be taken, they're going to, and it's going to be occupied, and it's going to be lost. The manifest destiny that I grew up with always leaves out that, oh, we will go, America will go to the Western Ocean. Well, it kind of forgets that 75% of that land was still owned by Native peoples who don't want Europeans moving in. In fact, this is one of the major reasons for the American Revolution was because the Native Americans had been allies to the British army during the French and Indian War, the thing they got was protections. The thing they got was a limit to the mountains. Okay, Europeans can, can occupy the mountains, but we get west of the mountains, right? Like, that's our land. And the British said, yeah, you're allies. We're cool. Well, now with the British out, Settlers, farmers, white men with guns are going to flood the West. And the more people who are going to be dumped from Europe into America, the more are going to come West and they're going to bring their guns and their violence and their hunger for land and they're going to murder the Native Americans, they're going to murder the Mexicans, they're going to steal the land from both and they're going to carve it up. There's the conquest of the West, the conquest of Mexico, the conquest of the natives, of the indigenous peoples. And there's a lot of heroism and great stories as a, the Alamo and all. It's also a shirt ton, a lot of blood and murder and rape and death. The conquest of America is not nice. And we shouldn't forget that. It was done on the backs of black, brown, red people. And white people. Shit. And white people. And fellow white people. White people are going to be carved up 
sold off, going to be ground up by industrialization, the railroads. White people had a better chance of escaping it. Native Americans had no chance. The Mexicans will be pushed aside. Black people will be enslaved and then um, exploited. Which brings us to number three. The third result is slavery will continue in America. It will end in the 1830s in the British Empire. And the British will stop the slave trade. Now it will continue, slavery will continue. The last place to have slavery in the Western world is Brazil. It will continue to like 1888. But in America, it will continue to 1865. It would have ended in the 1830s had the American colonists not revolted. So it's bad for, black, for Africans, bad for black people. The American Revolution was bad for black folk. It didn't apply to them. Millions of people are going to be turned into, into servitude, rape, and violence. And this is very Hobbesian. The strong exploit the weak. If you didn't want to be treated like a slave, you shouldn't have been a slave. And this is why slave revolts, uprisings, resistances are constant and a constant fear. Now, white people gain freedom and equality. Even the Irish, even the Catholics will eventually be absorbed and become white. And this is a process in Nell Painter's book, The History of White People, where immigrants coming from Europe are not considered white. They're not British. If they're British, they're white. British wasps, Protestants, they're white. But what about the Germans? What about German Protestants? What about German Catholics? What about Irish Catholics? Irish Catholics are without a doubt not white because they're occupied in Europe. The British spent 200 years obliterating them, carving up their land. They are an occupied people. So then they come to America and they're going to be considered just like the Brits? No way. They're not white. But in a world that has a million African slaves, the Irish can become white. The Germans can become white. Because otherwise, there's not enough British. And so color, because of slavery, color becomes important rather than culture. Because there's not enough British. There's people, there's a racist today who are talking about, uh, it's the end of white people. And dude, white people ended in like 1790. Like by 1800, there are more Germans than there are Brits. Like very early on, there's more more immigrant Germans than there are British citizens in America. Like, but the Germans became white people. The British, and uh, more importantly, Americans, American white people were always willing to absorb new immigrants eventually. That second or third generation. That first generation is not white, whether they're Irish, Italian, uh, Jewish. They are not us, they are not American. Learn English. Crazy Catholics. Jesus killing Jews. They're not us. But the second generation, the third generation, by the third, fourth, by the fourth generation, they're marrying your kids. And so there's, they become American. They become white because African slaves can never be white in this argument because of their skin color. And they're not... Remember, miscegenation laws go until 1972. You're not allowed... Black people and white people are not allowed to get married in lots of states till 1972. That's not ancient history. That's now. So white people got freedom and equality. They got lock. Eventually. If they were white farmers, they got lock immediately. If they were immigrants, they'll get their children will get lock. The idea of being free and equal and being part of the society. But slavery reduced millions of people to Hobbesian servitude. 
And so you have these two systems. It is not a surprise that America broke down into civil war because you have two philosophical systems that are antithesis to each other. Locke and Hobbes do not work together because their attitudes towards people are different. And so the question was ultimately always going to be, is America a Hobbesian state or a Lockean one? Number four is, what about America? Well, the rich stay in charge, and we see this in the Constitution. This is the big thing. The Constitution, for all of our talk about Bernie and Bernie got stolen from and the Electoral College and Hillary Clinton should have won because she had more votes, and the all of your arguments are against the founding of the American Constitution because the American Constitution did not want ordinary people anywhere near politics. Politics were for the rich. Senators were chosen by the states. By the state legislature, not by people. The president was chosen by the states. That's the Electoral College, not by the people. There is no popular vote recorded till like, is it 1824? It's one of the Jackson ones. It's got to be the first Jackson one because Jackson got it stolen from him. He like was so popular that when he lost to John Quincy Adams, his his Bernie bros, his Jackson bros, his Jackson Joes were like, that's impossible. It's too, it's impossible that he lost. We got to start counting these votes. And that's the start. Like the first bunch of elections, there is no popular vote. Your vote literally didn't matter. It wasn't counted. The state voted for the president, not the person. The rich created the Constitution to keep the rich in charge. It's as simple as that. Now, we have moved, and we will talk in this class about moving towards democracy. So this, so America is more democratic than it was under a king, but it's not a democracy. It is a republic, and in a republic, the rich people run the show. Their representatives make the laws. You don't. We are not a democracy. In a democracy, the people are sovereign, not in a republic. Nobody asks your opinion about the laws. You don't vote on them. Maybe if you're in some of the states that have referendums, you get a more democratic system. But if you have a state legislature making laws, you're in a republic, man. You're not in a democracy. There are people determining your government for you. You get to have a say in who those people are, but it's a minor say because it's diluted by all the other people who have a say. The only thing you have a direct vote on is your property taxes and school budget. That's it. Otherwise, you are voting for representatives to do things for you. So what did a poor get out of this? If the rich get power, what did a poor get out in, out of, uh, of the American Revolution? Well, the poor get land. They get freedom, quote unquote. They get equality, quote unquote. They get to go west, murder the Indians, enslave the Africans, and do whatever the F they wanted to do out there. And that gives them, that's not nothing. It sounds like, wait a minute. But that attitude of, I'm equal to you. You're not better than me. I don't care how much money you have. You're not my Lord. Like one of the most underappreciated parts of the constitution is the part that says there are no titles that no matter who you are, who your father is, it don't matter. You are not titled in America. You might be rich and that gives you power. but your poop stinks just like everybody else's. And so Americans have an attitude, an attitude that you see in Athens, that Greeks who were writing about Athens at the time were like, you know, these Athenians, they they just walk like they own the sidewalk. They just, you know, they think they're all, well, they did because they were democratic. They had a say in their government. They weren't being told what to do by kings. 
And so there's this American attitude. You see it in De, to De Tocqueville, in Democracy in America. And this is his big thing is Americans act. They walk different than Europeans. They're not peasants. They're citizens. They have a connection. Even though it's hard to have a say in your government, you still have a say. You are not told what to do. And so there is an American attitude from the very beginning that sets Americans apart from Europeans, from Canadians. Part of that attitude is an embrace of violence, of massive violence. America is conquered. Slavery is enforced. Violence is natural. You had to bring your gun to the West. You had to enforce servitude on your slaves. There's a constant fight for honor because now there's no titles. There's no one who says, yes, sir. There's no one who bows down to you. All white, and this is where Jefferson, in creating the University of Virginia, was like, ah, I love this story. This is a recent story I came across, but Jefferson creates the University of Virginia to be a Southern Harvard, a secular Southern Harvard, Princeton, Columbia, you know, King's College, that those Northerners have these big institutions, but they're all one religious. They're all they're, the point of them was to po create pastors and create a religious elite for Protestant society. Like that's their job that they turned into great universities is kind of by accident. But Jefferson, who's a deist, much more scientific, wants a, a, a much more science. He wants a STEM university and he wants one in the South. So he's going to build one in Virginia, the greatest of all the states, the new states of this new country, the richest state. And he creates it. And it's beautiful. I mean, if you've ever been to the University of Virginia, it's just gorgeous. And then Southern boys show up. And it is a disaster. And Jefferson is horrified. Because what he wanted was a scientific, educational, democratic, equality community of learning. And what he got was the sons of slave masters who are used to not being told what to do and are used to having sex with the women they want to have sex with and are used to abusing the servants that they get to abuse. And they're not used to having to deal with other white people in close quarters equally. Like if you're the son of the Southern plantation owner, all the other white people on your plantation work for you. The slaves are your property, but the other, the, 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 the field managers are your employees. You get to boss them around. And all of a sudden, these guys are coming together. They're all little lords. And none of them, because there's no titles, none of them want to take a backseat to anybody else. And so you get honor fighting. You get honor killings. You get duels. You get, they are they they abuse the, the the African servants, even though they don't own them. They b abuse the school's African servants, and then they fight with the other whites because there's no no way of knowing who's more important than who. So since you're in a democracy in this this republic, everybody is technically equal. So they fight it all. They fight it out. They fight out a hierarchy. This is Hamilton and Burr. This idea, even though they're northerners, this idea of honor, is this violence is part of America because Hamilton and Burr are equals. In fact, Burr is more elite than Hamilton, but in America, that don't matter. They don't have a list of titles of who's who ranks who, who's more important than who. So the only way to do that is to Force it is to prove it. Is the so honor 
and violence to protect your honor is an immense part of, Amer of being an American. So America is born and lives in violence, in constant violence. And so now we're in the 21st century and we're like, why is America washing guns? Why is there murders every day? Because that's who we are. That's who we've always been. All right, in our next episode, we are going to talk about the French Revolution, the even more important one. And um, the one that rocks Europe is the large starts, the Napoleonic Wars, which are the largest wars Europe will have since 1648 and until the First World War. Um, so that's what we're going to do next. We're going to, we're going to murder rich people and then obliterate Europe. So that's what we're going to talk about next. Be safe. Take care. See you soon.